I'll hand it over to Michael um, when you're ready, Michael, if that's OK. Yeah, I'm ready. So uh, thank, um, thank you. Lovely. So welcome everybody to another uh, webinar from the South uh, London Primary Care. Where, um, yeah, today we're discussing diabetic foot, a very common um, problem we all encounter in our clinics. Um, so today we're going to give you a practical overview of um, how we uh, approach diabetic foot, so both from the surgical point of view, but also from the medical point of view. And as you do know, the multidisciplinary approach is the one which is gives by, by far the best results. So I have a, um, a great group of colleagues today talking. Um, um, so uh, once I finish my introduction, then uh, I'll hand you over to Dr. Natasha Patel, who's going to talk about the uh, multidisciplinary um, diabetic foot um, pathway. Then my colleague Luke Labiaz is going to talk to you, um, who is a consultant of vascular surgery, and so Dom is going to talk to you about how we deal with this uh, um, now. And um, uh, Mr. Cr Dr. Chris Mann is going to talk to you about the um, diagnosis symptoms of the uh, diabetic foot vascular disease. Uh, again, another great talk from Honey Slim, our colleagues, uh, colleague in uh, King's College, and then we'll follow, wrap it up with some conclusions and questions and answers. Please feel free to type your um, uh, questions in so we can answer them. If you want something, you know, ask quickly. Uh, one of the speakers, I we can always uh, at the end of the speaker talk to them, but normally we try and do all this at the end. So I'll hand you without further ado to um, Dr. Patel, who is going to talk to you about the um, diabetic uh, feet referral pathways. Natasha. All yours. Welcome. Hello, thank you. So there's been a lot of work that we've done over the last five years to streamline things as to how to make it easier for primary care to refer to one of our multidisciplinary foot team meetings. Um, it's now done on ERS and you can refer either directly to your local MDFT clinic or any of us actually in the uh, in the network and I'll show you on the next slide where those all those clinics are. If, oh, no, just sorry, go back. If there are no available slots on the ERS, um, then please defer to provider. Uh, depending on the history, we will make the decision and we will organise to see the patient sooner if needed. If you have any concerns, and I appreciate how busy you guys all are in clinic, um, just email the email address that we have provided here and we will uh, screen and then take it from there sort out the appointment at the closest MDFT that we have. Please don't email us. It should be either ERS or use this uh, navigator role that we have available for you. OK, next slide, please. So this is where currently we have all our MDFTs um, and we've tried to do this so that we can treat patients if possible more local to, to where they're living. So we have our big main sites at Guy's and St Thomas's and at King's Hospital. And then we have sites and each of our um, peripheral diabetes for MDTs, as I call them, all have vascular surgeons associated with them. So we have a clinic running at the Pru, a clinic running at Lewisham Hospital. We have one at Queen Elizabeth, another one at Durant Valley, another one at Queen Mary in Sidcup and a hospital in Tunbridge Wells. Next slide, please. And um, there, each of your areas have your own foot care pathways. We have clear diabetes foot care pathways mapped out, and that mainly is more responsible as to who provides the care for when somebody has low risk foot or a moderate risk uh, for diabetic foot disease. As soon as they become high or they're active, then they're referred to their local MDFTs. And again, um, if you use this, um, I never know what you call these, but these kind of so-called modern day version of a barcode on your phone, you'll have access to your local diabetes foot care pathway. Cool, I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. We're now handing it over to Lukla, who has his own slides to present today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Let me go on the sharing mode. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. OK. 
just launch the presentation. Okay, here we are. So I just thought to give you all the background. Of course, uh, the diabetic foot condition, although is a uh, is a uh, um, condition per se in terms of a vascular assessment, uh, uh, comes into the broader picture of uh, critical limb ischemia, or as we refer now uh, as a chronic uh, limb threatening condition, CLTI, chronic limb threatening ischemia. From a, from a primary care point of view, I would strongly recommend you to um, have uh, in uh, your practice access to these current guidelines, which are uh, on the uh, right hand side, the European uh, Vascular Society guidelines for the treatment of uh, PAD and uh, on the um, sorry, on the left hand side on the, on the right hand side is the specific guidelines for the uh, CLTI, which are called the Global Vascular Guidelines. And uh, they are so important because most of the guidelines focus on the medical management, uh, mainly uh, cardiovascular risk factor prevention, uh, primary assessment, uh, and uh, with the surgery, of course, uh, being a relevant uh, part of, the, of these uh, section guidelines, but uh, just a minimal part. So those are the guidelines that they can provide the state of the art uh, of uh, the medical management, medical and surgical management, uh, which is a holistic approach uh, to critical limb ischemia. Of course, as a surgeons uh, and as a uh, you know spe specific uh, specialist uh, referring uh, service, we focus mainly on CLI, critical limb ischemia, which in the uh, PAD classification is basically uh, the Rutherford um, stages four, five, and six. So patients that have rest pain is typically ischemic rest pain that, uh, as you know, will normally be described as uh, inability to sleep uh, and having to um, hang the foot off the bed at nighttime and specifically the presence of tissue loss that can be minor or major. So those are the patients that needs to enter into a semi-urgent referral pathway that I will show you in a few seconds. Why as uh, vascular surgeons we are focusing mainly on a critical limb ischemia rather than claudication patient, for example, because as you well known, the CLI patients are the one that have a, a very poor outcome. Uh, the medical evidence shows that the one year outcome is that uh, the uh, majority of them, over 55% of CLI patients will be either dead or with a limb loss within a year. So we needed to uh, focus our attention on these patients uh, with the same um, timeline that we would offer to patients with uh, cancer. Um, and as you know, the prevalence is mainly in the elderly uh, patients, but we are actually seeing how the PAD disease is becoming more and more prevalent in uh, younger in younger patients. And after the COVID uh, pandemic and lockdown, it's quite impressive to see how the age has shifted from the seventh decade to the fourth and fifth decade of our patients. And of course, as you can see, in especially in high income countries, which are highlighted in red in this uh, diagram, okay, still the cardiovascular risk factors are mainly uh, smoking, hypertension, cholesterol, and of course, uh, male, male gender. But, and, th and that's why there is a huge emphasis on uh, primary assessment and prevention. So from a primary care point of view, it's uh, uh, very important to assess this patient with a basic physical examination. And of course, ABPI can be the center of, of, of the examination with the limitation of the ABPI, because especially diabetic patients uh, often have uh, calcified the TBO vessels with, uh, uh, with particularly high 
occlusive ankle pressures greater than 180 and 200, so your ABPI could be unreliable, but that's always a first line investigation. My recommendation is always to uh, join uh, the uh, findings, the numbers with the old fashioned face to face assessment. Uh, what, what is new in terms of medical management? Actually, in the last couple of years, there's been quite a few important publications that have a slightly changed uh, the approach in terms of uh, primary uh, man management. So in terms of a secondary prevention, OK, we are now uh, giving more and more importance to the combination of a single antiplatelet agent like aspirin to low dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram twice a day. This publication, this randomized control trial that was public on Lancet a few years ago, has actually showed that the benefit of this combination, uh, the trial was called COMPASS. So we call it now COMPASS uh, uh, medical management. So aspirin 75 plus rivaroxaban 2.5 twice a day for secondary prevention. I have to say that these studies, although uh, offers a level A medical evidence. Uh, uh, sorry, just go back. Um, let me go back to that. Although as a, as a randomized trial offers a level A evidence, has uh, some uh, uh, limitations. First of all, as uh, did not uh, compare this combination of, men, of uh, uh, medical management to, for example, dual antiplatelet therapy. And also the study was uh, industry uh, funded study buyer, of course. So, uh, you know, we need always to be a bit critical, but that's what is new in terms of uh, secondary prevention. In, in real practice, patients that have already had a revascularization, either old fashioned or bypass surgery or endovascular treatment, we tend uh, to combine uh, therapy and have a dual antiplatelet therapy most of the time. Um, but again, there has been a new trial that is exactly the same design of the previous COMPASS trial that is called Voyager, um, which suggested the benefit again of aspirin and low-dose rivaroxaban. However, be cautious because in this study has come out that elderly patients may have an increased risk of bleeding. So we need to particularly be cautious about combining an antithrombotic to an antiplatelet. I would say in normal practice, we tend to keep this patient on dual antiplatelet, especially when the treatment is from the groin down and single antiplatelet from the groin up. Again, uh, in primary care, uh, a huge emphasis needs to go also on early pain control and pain management. So very low threshold for ischemic patients to be started on uh, um, on analgesia uh, because you know as we know this ischemic pain is very uh, reluctant to medications and uh, to pain control so we need to be particularly aggressive on that and then i don't know if my colleagues will uh, um, uh, will talk about that when it comes to the diabetic foot ulcers of course that is always a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach and in the First uh, assessment, uh, there is always the three elements that need to come together and are the ischemia, so the, you know, the uh, vascular assessment, um, but also the extent of, of the wound and the degree of infection. So we are now implementing this new classification, American classification that is called Wi-Fi. Uh, and the acronym the acronym stands for wound ischemia and uh, food infection so i i would suggest you to get quite uh, useful used to this classification also because the new national wound care strategy program uh, referral uh, system that will be implemented soon so will probably be available with with your practice soon is actually taking into account these three elements. And uh, as a referral, you will be asked to provide information 
on all of these uh, three elements. Uh, of course, you know, we need to be wary about uh, classification systems because uh, they are sometimes misleading and they never picture the reality. OK, so uh, we 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 like classifications because they can summarize a complex condition in simple words, but every patient is different. Um, finally, I want to highlight to you what are the new recommendations that comes from NHS England and from the Vascular Society when it comes to critical limb ischemia, uh, which those recommendations are based on the increased prevalence of uh, this population in our community. Um, so there are several targets. I want to take your time on each individual target. But basically what the new recommendations suggest are um, quite clear. So for patients that are already in hospital with a critical limb ischemia, we are committed to provide a surgical treatment within five days from admission, which is a very challenging task. When it comes to outpatients, so uh, to patients that you see in your practice, Again, we have a very stringent uh, uh, targets and uh, so far are very difficult to be implemented, but possibly with your collaboration and with your support, we are trying to meet these targets. And the targets are patients to be vetted within 24 hours from your referral. And that's that's a very, very important point. So we need to work together so that the referral is accurate as possible and for us to be available to vet that referral. Of course, if the referrals remains too general, for example, if you just refer to us a patient with a swollen leg and some skin breakdown, that will make it quite difficult to give it the appropriate emergency uh, timely, uh, timely uh, assessment. But if you can, uh, again, based on the previous information, uh, have a very accurate referral, we will be committed to see the patients within a week in our uh, spoke hospital, have a cross-sectional imaging, so a CT scan, and discuss the patient the following week in our multidisciplinary MDT and have a surgical intervention within two weeks. To be realistic, we are still a little bit far from this goal, but again, it needs to be a joint commitment and effort to reach that target. OK, and those are some other sub targets within these new referral pathways. And you can imagine the complexity, especially in such a large network that we are facing to try to get close to this. But of course, that's in the patient's best interest. And uh, if I have a few more minutes, I just want to touch base with you on what is new in vascular surgery. So our technology has actually increased quite significantly in the last few years. For example, now we are kind of moving away from the old fashioned uh, keyhole angioplasty and stenting to uh, new technologies. For example, this is called the shockwave or an intravascular lithotripsy, which is basically the translation of the uh, renal nephrolithiasis for the kidney stone that you know well to treat the calcified arteries of diabetic patients. So we use a balloon at low inflation that produce a shock waves to disrupt the calcium inside the vessel of the artery. This is, for example, a case that I have done um, during the pandemic. As you can see, an extensive blockage in the femoral popliteal artery in a in an elderly patient with a, with a leg ulcer and um, the gentle ballooning of the artery and uh, the emission of the shock wave allows uh, the artery basically to regain its normal compliance and its normal luminal gain so we call this uh, a stentless option or leave nothing behind option 
So it's quite a revolutionary approach to the keyhole treatment. And we can do this also combining the old fashioned open surgery, like the repair of ephemeral artery in the groin, which is then used as a keyhole entry to treat the arteries either up in the iliac or lower down in the leg. You can see here the balloon, very low pressure, and every cycle of a, a shockwave, the artery gets more compliant and the waste in the balloon is resolved and the artery goes back, goes back to normal. In this case, I just use a very short stent to avoid any further reintervention. Another option is a kind of a drilling option. It's called the atherectomy device. So we are using this fancy drilling catheter to drill through the blockage of the artery. And again, this is a very good option in the small arteries and calcified blocked artery, where of course we would like to stay away from using a small stent that could easily block. So you can see here the tip of this drilling catheter that goes uh, through the blockage and we use a filter downstream to stop from emboli and we follow this drilling with again plain or drug coated balloon angioplasty and the uh, ideal outcome is to have a uh, restoration of the flow in the artery without the need of a stent. That's how it was before and that's how it was after. And then we can push again at this technology. In this patient, we use the, the drilling atherectomy device in the femoral popliteal segment and the shock wave in the very small arteries below the knee uh, with the view of not disrupting or rupturing the arteries. So to summarize, uh, as a vascular surgeon, OK, we are focusing more and more our service on the treatment of urgent uh, critical limb ischemia and the diabetic foot condition. And the commitment, a joint commitment will be to treat this patient within uh, two weeks from your own referral. And in the case of uh, urgent diabetic foot condition, possibly even earlier than that. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. And I think it was so useful to see those images as well. I think um, that was really useful. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, we're now handing over to Mr. Chris Manu if he is here with his colleague. Yes, uh, okay. here I am. So stop sharing and then I'll share my slides. Is this OK? Yeah, that's the button. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides OK? Can someone answer me? They can see the slides OK. Yeah, perfect. Sorry, I was on mute there. Oh, OK, excellent. OK, sorry. OK, so yeah, so hopefully quite a crystal talk through diabetic foot, vascular disease, the um, diagnosis and symptoms. And what I hope to perhaps talk to you about is really what the impact is and perhaps to go through what the caveats are or what the, the things that may cut you out whilst you're trying to do it. But I think we all know from medical school to do anything, history, examination and then investigation. So I'll run you through that very quickly, but perhaps pointing out the areas that we need to watch out for. So first of all, yes, we know that diabetic foot is associated with end vascular disease, associated with high risk of failure of wound healing, high risk of undergoing minor amputation and major amputation, and then high risk of death. And you've got those two coexisting. But the presence of, of vascular disease significantly increases the poor, the poor clinical outcome. And as such, if you take nothing away from the next 10 minutes, is that early diagnosis is the real objective. Early diagnosis allows the techniques that you've seen, early intervention and everything to, to be done. Perhaps to convince you a little bit more, um, this is the data from the National Diabetes Foot Care Audit, 
which where everyone running a diabetic foot clinic is supposed to send data about their ulcer outcome or patients that they receive with foot ulceration. And now there's data of nearly about you know, 30,000 presentations. And the key bit to see here, just you can see my, um, you can see the, the, the pointer, is, is the, the imp impact of ischemia. So with ischemia, and this is just by palpating the pulses, that there is you know, more than you know, four, four times the increased risk of undergoing an amputation within six months. This is just by feeling the pulses. So knowing whether they've got ischemia is very, very important and picking it up correctly. Why again is it important to collect the image? You probably heard about this several times that having PAD or vascular disease and diabetes is worse than most cancers. So having just a neuropathic ulcer, your five year mortality is close to 50 percent. Whereas for prostate cancer, breast cancer, Hodgkin's disease, you know, it's less, it's, it's around 20 percent. And if you've got PAD or peripheral vascular disease and you develop an ulcer, your five year mortality is nearly 60 percent. So again, I stress it, the checking that the patient has got peripheral vascular disease is very, very important when they present. So how do we go about study then? OK, so for, for any diagnosis, first of all, we say, okay, or in, in, in the good history, history, history taken, or it has to start with that. So we need a detailed history to undertake before you are taking the vascular assessment. But one key thing to mention from that is patients having coexisting like retinopathy or nephropathy, people who are on dialysis, people who've got ischemic, uh, sorry, cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease, previous strokes, current smokers. These are really the textbook bits that we all know. So if a patient has got a history of amputations or they've had a history of uh, angioplasties or they've got previous ulcerations or they've got tissue necrosis, then even before you, you do anything, you know that this patient might have um, a peripheral vascular disease. Again, some of the symptoms that can be quite vague or, or are, are sort of like we talk about claudication, but I'll come back to that. The rest pain, cold feet, skin discoloration. So these are things that, yes, we all know that we will ask for when we are taking a history. But it is important to know that even within the history, because of the presence of neuropathy, the, the description of a rest pain can be picked up very, very late, or the patient may not have a rest, uh, a rest pain per se. And again, um, we, we are usually taught that with um, PAD or peripheral vascular disease, usually you get ulceration on the lateral of the borders of the foot. But most people are still having um, non-healing ulcer on the plantar aspect, and they could still be um, ischemic. Again, because of sometimes infection increases the oxygen demand and people having diabetes with the high blood sugars is increased risk of infection. As such, the, the onset of the necrosis in the foot can be much more rapid than we, we, we suspect. We also always ask about people about the claudication, but it's important to note that these patients have got disease below the ankle, so they are not likely to have um, um, claudication or calf pain. And by the time they start getting calf pain, it's quite late on. So the, in the history, we say the patient does not have any claudication pain, it can be really, really leading. One other aspect that we also, I know when we talk about the general population, we talk about ABPIs, but again, I'll show you some data that shows that even people with an absolute normal ABPI, a significant proportion still have uh, peripheral vascular disease or they have a low pressure. And that's because they've got disease or got almost ultra distal disease. From your history taking, perhaps we then move on to examination. And we all say in examination is best to, to look. And you're making a, taking a good look at the feet and it's always good to compare one foot to the other. Sometimes the changes can be very, very subtle. I was saying with this patient here, so you can have this previous amputation, and you can almost see the sunset of the sort of the forefoot, which can sometimes be misdiagnosed as cellulitis. But again, the patient has got significant forefoot ischemia, but they will not have the rest pain, unlike the people with diabetes. Sorry, people without diabetes, they will have rest pain. So, and because you see people who've been treated as cellulitis, cellulitis for weeks and weeks and weeks until gangrene sets in. It's also important to point out people with uh, pigmented skin because sometimes 
the early signs of ischemia are much more subtle to pick unless you really compare it with the other leg or look higher up the leg to see the hyperpigmentation, which again sometimes gets misdiagnosed as cellulitis or by looking at one leg, it might be missed completely. Again, one of what happens is in terms of um, other things that you can see on the skin, like with loss of skin hair, thinning of the skin, you know, thickening of the nails, um, discoloration I've talked about again, but I we'll put this one up to basically just show that sometimes the changes in people with dark skin can be very, very subtle and difficult to pick up. Again, from here, the one on your far left, I think it's very, very easy to pick up all that the right leg is ischemic, but to pick up ischemia and people with dark skin, police for repeating it, can sometimes be very, very subtle to pick it up on examination. Moving on to Traditionally, we have always talked about there are, that there have been about two types of surface foot. We used to talk about was the neuropathic foot and the neuroischemic foot. But when diagnosing PAD or vascular disease in people with diabetes, it's important to appreciate that there is a spectrum of it and they all progress or, or, or deteriorate in a completely different way. So you can have the renal ischemic foot, whereby they get necrosis of the toes, and that can happen very, very quickly with significant sort of microcirculation uh, or poor microcirculation. And you've got the acute embolic event that sometimes the whole foot can go very mottled very, very quickly. Also, the critical level will be with small embolic events to the tips of the toe. And even some people who have got shark of foot or bone deformity that we used to think that that was a neuropathic condition, there's a lot of patients with shark of foot that still have significant peripheral vascular disease. So the, the main message is that unless you look for it, you will not find it. And depending on what the patient's sort of comorbidities are, they can progress very, very rapidly. And Chris, again, so sorry, to from, sorry to quickly yeah. interrupt you, Chris. Apologies. Just yeah. that, um, maybe if you turn your um, camera off, I think you may have frozen, um, and we've just we're oh, receiving right. a few delays on the slides. All right. Okay. What about? Is that okay for now? Um, would you be able right. to? Would you be able to stop sharing and then come back to sharing? That we we could try that to see if that's working. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Sometimes it's just a Wi-Fi connection and just has a few delays. But if you come back to present your slides, um, sometimes that does the trick. OK, can you hear me now? OK. And yeah. Let's try again. I go to there. A bit, a bit. Is it back on now? Um, I can't see anything. It's just a blank screen for for the moment. I'm not sure if that's happening for you, Lisa, and or others as well. Ah, uh, yeah, perfect. It's come up now. Amazing. Okay, I Thank think you. It's a bit Thanks of a time. Much, it's a bit of a time lag. Is it okay for now? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. All Thank right. you. OK, so I was saying, I was saying previously we thought the ischemia in the foot or diabetic foot was either neuropathic or neuroischemic. But actually, we need to appreciate that there's a whole spectrum and they all progress in a slightly different way. The renal ischemic would have gone acute embolic events or sort of like temporary sort of shedding and having sort of um, embolic events to the tips of the toe. And sometimes people with um, neuro, uh, shark of foot, which we thought was a neuropathic condition, can still have peripheral vascular disease. So from the discussion of sort of history examination, the next bit is about investigation. And I think in the investigation, it's important to note that the investigation is ought to be ultra distal or distal, looking for the disease in the distal part of the limb. And this is a study from Italy where they looked at uh, angiographic images of more than 2000 patients and try to classify them as to where the disease pattern was. And as you can see, as you get also whether it was in the inflow, the femoral, the thigh, also the cruel vessels. And as we get older, we get more distal disease. Um, as we, in the male gender, it was more proximal and again distal. 
in diabetes, most of them have distal disease. With hypertension, they tend to have occlusions all the way through. With high cholesterol, disease was more proximal, and in smoking, again, all was more proximal. So our cohorts of patients we see in the foot they of diabetes are mainly that male and with diabetes, and the disease is in the cruel vessels. So you need to really look for the disease below the ankle or below the calves. So moving on from that, so on the, in terms of that side, yes, palpation of the pulses, the various tests, and letting the leg see whether it goes pale, as the textbooks will say, ABPIs, as I said here, but again, I think that the, the diabetic foot world, the push is more to do toe ankle pressures, um, to, to all break your pressures because there's some people who have got below the ankle is, is that API do not put them up. And of course, the Doppler waveforms, if you've got that, the triphasic or figure, um, the people with damped flow. I think it is very, very, very important, and I say this because of the next slide, that in people without diabetes, yes, ABPI is, is reliable, but from data, for example, from our center as well, are nearly 70% of patients with an absolute normal ABPI. So not those with a raised ABPI, not those with more than 1.3, but between 0.9 and 1.3 can still have a low toe pressure. So I know there's a good move to go through to the Wi-Fi, which tries to combine, like uh, we said earlier, that stuff, combine the wound ischemia and, and an infection. But sometimes the ischemia elements can be slightly overshadowed by the other two, that the, the level of ischemia can be diminished. I think um, my colleague, the slim, will show you some of the pictures that sometimes ulcers look benign, but they could still have significant ischemia despite having a normal, uh, normal uh, AB, ABPI, so normal just according to the Wi-Fi criteria. So there are all these images that when you see us with the patients, we can do that further and not to go through the other tests that can be done, but this is more for when the patients have seen us in the main centers. But even within this, for most of the scans, imaging of the below the ankle disease, so most of the scans will give you good readings to up to the calves, but unless you ask for dedicated scans of below the ankle, significant disease can still be missed. So in conclusion, I think that PAD and diabetic foot is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And patients with diabetes have a phenotype of the below the ankle disease that is not always fully appreciated. Regardless of how the terminologies are made, whether it's called PAD, peripheral vascular disease, ischemia, uh, critical limb ischemia, chronic long-term uh, um, uh, uh, chronic limb threatening ischemia, the key bit is that when you pick up with someone who's got PAD or you think it's got peripheral vascular disease and it's got diabetes and it's got tissue loss, I think from we heard from the, lab, the first of refer them to the MDD because time is of the essence. So the key bit is significant comorbidities, sorry, mortality and morbidity and refer them on as soon as you can. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you quickly. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I believe Mr. Honey Slim is next to you and will be presenting as well. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, let me have a look at this one here. Yeah, you can turn on it. Well, I think the camera of course is a delay. Oh, okay. Let's see. I have to say, I wish that meeting was face to face. So I would have loved to see all the faces and get to know. Uh, each of you in person. My name is Henny Slim. I work at King's College Hospital, part of the uh, King Tess Partners uh, group. And the talk today, I kept it very simple, something which hopefully it will communicate with most of you about the importance of these diabetic foot patients we're seeing. And just to keep it simple, try to give you a highlight of when or how important of having earnest detection of these problems, the when, where and how to refer these cases. If I put such a picture and ask all of you, if you come across any of these patients, similar patients in your clinic, how worried would you be? I mean, it goes without saying, all of you will be worried and all of you will be on the phone 
to the local vascular surgeon or even send them straight to AME because obviously these are patients who need immediate uh, help. But the problem is always what they say, the trick in it is in the small details. It's these patients that come to you a little bit subtle presentation. You are not that worried when you see them, say maybe there is something, but doesn't seem there is a problem, something like that. If I put a picture for you, somebody coming with the tip of the toe, patch of skin gangrene, and the approach for this patient would be what? Will Honey, you say I'm sorry to interrupt. I just that uh, um, we can't still see the screen. The screen, the slides are filled from caresses. Ah, is it? So what should I do? Um, so I would maybe if you can come out and present to you. So let us one second. Was this one? Yeah. No. And then there is there a button that just says from um from current slide rather than. Do you, do you think we should put the camera off? Yeah, sometimes okay. that works with with reducing Wi-Fi capacity. That's yeah. Excellent. But we still we uh, can still see um, Chris's slides for the moment. Ah, you says you can still see Chris's slide. Yeah, I think there just must be a, a lag on the, on the internet front. There might be a lag. Uh, did you see any of my slides, or we're still waiting for Chris's slides? No, we're st I, I can only still see on Chris's. Yeah. Ah. Uh, let us see. Shall I stop sharing and start sharing again? Okay. Yeah, it, when you stop sharing and then if you can go back onto the presentation and it will just say yeah. it should say at the top yeah. slideshow and then from current slide. So you then won't have to go through all the all the different slides that Chris had presented. Yeah. Can you see that? Can you see this slide now? Not right now. You can't see the slides. It might just be taking a while. What are you? What can you see in front of you? The the, the full uh, screen. Close this one. Let's um, try. Because we close the Chris uh, slides, it's totally different now. Share again. Share again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What about now? What do you think now, Liberty? Um, I can't see anything right now. No. I imagine it's my imagine it's just slow and it's just taking its time because I can see movement on my screen, but I just it's just not fully loaded right now. And I think it's the same the same as having some other attendees as well. Is it? Let me try one more time to share it. Why? Why? why I'm just going to close the slides, close everything, and then come back once. Okay. Cool. So we're gonna Apologies about this, everyone. It's just I, I'm sure yeah. everyone is understanding with the last few years of <laughs> doing things on Teams. It can just be tricky, can't it? How's that looking, Chris? What's what can you see now? We we are trying to share one second. Cool. Mm. But now, is it there? Um, no, I can still see a black a black screen. Black screen. It might be loading. Might be. So for a bit. On the other note, ah, with, bingo. Yeah, we can see that. Is it there? Yeah, we can see your first slide. Yeah. If I move it right now, can you see the second one? 
just to see how much delay there are. Yeah, I think it's just still being, it's just still a bit of a delay. Yeah, I can see your first, slide uh, two. Yeah, I can. Okay, so I think I'm just going to say slide one, slide two, and we'll move it this way. Okay, okay, so, thank you, Chris. Uh, all right, so we are on the slide two, which is the horrible feet. Uh, as I said, uh, apologies for this delay, but if you came across these fees, you probably send this patient straight to an emergency without shadow of doubt. Uh, can you see now slide three, Liberty? Yeah. Lovely. So this is the this is the patient we are most concerned about because how would you approach this uh, case? Somebody coming with a patch of skin gangrene. Uh, and by the way, he doesn't have any rest pain to be concerned about because obviously he's diabetic. He doesn't report any claudication because obviously if he does have any diabetic distribution disease, it's in the crudal vessels, which would not give him claudication uh, most of the time. And he's only this small patch. So many of you might say, OK, let's review the patient in two or three weeks and see how he does. And if you are unlucky, he will go and he will miss his second appointment because, you know, the time frame to come and see you is very limited and he can easily miss that appointment. Or you might say, let's see him in two or three months. But some will say, let's get him a scan to assess what's his circulation. And for those who pick the scan, this is the scan of this gentleman, which uh, my colleague, Ms. Manu, just reflected. It's an AVPI. And the AVPI comes to show he has normal AVPI in both legs all the way down to his pedal vessels with the dorsalis pedis on one side is 1.2 and the other 1.2 and the PT 1.2 on the other side and 1.3, so normal. And funny enough, they gave you waveforms showing triphasic, fantastic. So a month later, this is the picture of the same patient and you can see the staggering progression of the disease from a patch of the skin to the tip of the toe to the whole toe and funny enough on the marsh picture you can start seeing that the forefoot itself is ischemic so what's really happening here what's happening is that when he came to see us this was his DTA the scan what we get at the foot level we are seeing more and more aggressive prevascular disease in patients at the ankle level where Based on this scan, it tells you that he's got the blockages and diminished supply to the mid and full foot. And this is his NGU where he gets, and you can see this reflects his AVPI, where he have a normal crural vessels up to the ankle, but then the problem lies that he has lost his anterior tibia and dorsalis pedis arch, and he has a tight narrowing in the posterior tibia just at the ankle level. He has a good angioplasty, successful amputation, and he has healed very well. So this is a case that can come across. And the question is how or what would you do if you have another patient a few months later? Say, oh, interesting, this is a different case. But this is one patient where he was referred for a quick advice at King's. We saw him and we organized for him to have a scan but he came two or three weeks later for his scan and unfortunately this was his foot even for us for a center which is very experienced in dealing with these we miscalculated it and the extent of the ischemic necrosis was shocking this is just a reflection that it is you can easily get it wrong and these patients need to be followed as soon as possible and uh, you need to act as fast as you can to save them from ischemic attack. Why this is important? Because this has been highlighted in major newspaper and around the country that thousands of patients are ending with needless amputation. And we know very well that these patients, once they have a major amputation, they don't do well. And if I take only the 30 day mortality rate, i.e. dying within 30 days from their major amputation, the results are shocking. And this is not to speak about the quality of life, which I think you would do it better than us because you will tend to see them more in the community and you know how much these major amputees, especially the elderly when they suffer once they are back home with a lot of quality. 
We know that our service here runs to have center when it comes to the diabetic food service. And there are uh, school, spoke centers that will always be able to contact us as soon as possible once you have a patient of concern. And although most of the patients here are treated endovascularly, 75% have got successful endovascular revascularization and quickly they go back to their routine. But we even push hard uh, to those remaining 30% that do not have uh, reasonable endovascular treatment through open surgery. And we are very proud of our results at the King's Health Partners. Mr. Hani, sorry, what just to interrupt I there. Um, I think we're still having a delay of the slides. Um, oh. So I wonder if maybe we could circulate the slides after the call. I feel free to continue, but just awareness that there yeah, is that delay. Sounds good. OK, that's great. Good, Thank you. That's a good idea. Thank you. So the patients which I really would be very concerned about and I urge you to focus on are any patient who comes from the district nurse where they've got the dressings and you feel the dressings have not been changed for a while. Be careful what's underneath. Don't just ignore it. Take the dressings down and many times you'll be shocked what you see, the extent of the tissue loss. And these patients, do not hesitate them to refer them immediately. The other point I urge you to act fast is any issue presenting with heal tissue loss. Even if a pressure uh, necrosis or patch of skin gangrene involving the heal, please refer them as soon as possible because these are the patients that once the heel pad is gone, it's so difficult to make them mobilize independently again, even if you restore the blood supply back to normal. And the reason behind this, it is so difficult to get tissue cover and skin cover over a full uh, heel pad necrosis. And not to forget and not to miss any patients coming with possible septic attack at the foot level. So cellulitis, bogginess in the foot, evidence that possible abscess. Don't waste your time in sending them referrals straight to X in emergency because many of them might harboring what we call gas gangrene and necrotizing fasciitis that will need extensive tissue debridement in theater as soon as possible. And these cases will not settle down with antibiotics, but will settle down with aggressive surgical intervention. So in conclusion is I urge you that have earnest detection to correct uh, management of these vital diabetic foot patients. Uh, this is extremely important as we believe major amputations is rarely indicated in critical leg ischemic patients once they are referred promptly and to the appropriate department. And just remember, there is always a huge multidisciplinary team at the hospital to give you help and support to deal with these patients and not keep it to yourself. And that's all. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Hani. And like we said, we will be able to circulate those slides to attendees today after the um, after the webinar. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say a big thanks to everyone who, who has attended today and, and for your patience for the tech issues. And I hope you've really enjoyed uh, the webinar. I've learned lots. Um, I'll invite Michael back in um, to kind of provide some conclusions to just uh, and to close. But um, I'll be sent a short, um, adding a, a quick feedback form in the chat just now to ensure that you can get your CBD points and certificate, which will be an automatic um, process once you complete the pro, um, complete the survey. So. Um, I'll put that in the chat now and I'll hand it over to Michael. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you everyone for a really great presentations. I hope this we throw a bit more light in the um, obscure um, the waters of diabetic food and hopefully get a bit more clear idea now. Look for when to refer. Um, are there any um, 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 questions you'd like to ask? Could you please type them so we can uh, um, get uh, our specialist to answer? OK. I can't see any answers, any questions so far. Um, 
So if everybody is happy, I think we can um, close this meeting. Um, thank you everyone for attending. So we will organize a new meeting soon and hopefully you see you all there. Hello, is, any, is anybody Thanks here? Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Thanks, I can hear you. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.